Mr. Secretary General, uh, uh, you held meetings with uh, President Traian Basescu, Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs Titus Corlățean, and the President of the Chamber of the, the, the Deputies, Valerius Gona. What were the main topics of discussions? First of all, uh, what the Council of Europe and uh, Romanian authorities can do together in the Parliament. We discussed, of course, the the rule of conduct for the parliament, um, which we have been involved in for quite a long time, uh, and also uh, how we can continue to, to work together to combat corruption, which is a widespread problem all over Europe now. Uh, with the president and uh, the foreign minister, we discussed also regional uh, issues and the situation in Ukraine and, um, and Moldova in particular. Um, I would like you uh, to ask you now about the, the recent European elections, uh, which is, shown, uh, is showing a mixed picture. On one hand, we have, uh, for the first time after uh, uh, the European elections started, we have a, a better turnout than uh, the last election. We have like 140 uh, Eurosceptics in the new parliament. At the same time, the, the main uh, uh, center parties, I mean the center right or center, uh, uh, so, uh, center left, have, uh, have kept the majority in the European Parliament. Well, what is your comment on these elections, considering that yeah. the, the National Front has won in France and you keep in Great Britain? Yeah, of course, it is worrying that uh, these more extreme parties uh, have uh, gained more ground, but we shouldn't forget that the uh, mainstream parties still keep the majority in the European Parliament. And I'm very glad to see that uh, Romania didn't go down the same route as, uh, for instance, France and some other countries. So uh, uh, I would like to, to, to say that uh, Romania has set a good example. There is obviously here a, a culture of um, not being going extreme and that's uh, indeed very good to see it. So, so I, I, I think we, we shouldn't exaggerate the um, outcome of these uh, elections. Yes, the extreme parties have gained somewhat more ground, but, but uh, I think that uh, the mainstream parties can, uh, can handle th this if they want. What, what do you think explains this? I mean, Romania, a younger democracy than others, has no populist or extremist uh, party in the European Parliament? Well, I think it may have to do with the fact that uh, you have uh, experienced uh, <laughs> extreme uh, political um, uh, behavior, I, I would say, uh, and you didn't w don't want to have this again. And also that in this part of Europe, a more used to um, having minorities, uh, diversity with regard to culture, religion, which uh, other parts of Europe uh, are worried about, actually. In an April report for the Council of Europe, you wrote that serious human rights violations, including corruption, human trafficking, racism and discrimination, persist across Europe. You also wrote that Europe is in the biggest human cri uh, rights crisis since the Cold War. What can the Council of Europe do to reverse this trend? And what should be the first priority of the European leaders in dealing with the situation? First of all, I think we, what we should do is to work uh, much more with our member states in order to get them to um, put in place le legislation uh, which uh, is in conformity with the European Convention and of Human Rights and that the political leaders take much more responsibility for doing that and not sending all, all the cases application to the court in Strasbourg. We have to focus now on getting member states to uh, fulfill the obligations they undertook when they signed up to the European uh, Convention. And this is uh, the most important part of the reform which I am doing in, in the Council, namely to to be more assistant oriented, work, I mean, provide over assistance to member states to make the necessary reforms. Uh, you know that the European Parliament adopted uh, this year the Human Rights Report, and the Human Rights Report was a request to the European Commission to adopt a mechanism to safeguard the European values. 
uh, like gender equality, um, uh, physically challenged or mentally challenged person, and uh, they want this mechanism, this uh, mechanism to safeguard the European value. Do you think that th uh, this could be a useful tool to, to achieve this? I think that um, it was necessary for the European Union to do something in order to get their member states to to uphold their the, their obligations. On the other hand, um, it's important also to say that the European Union doesn't have a legal competence, a legal basis for 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 taking action on many of the issues which are of interest for the public. And that's where the Council of Europe uh, comes in. And the European Union has said clearly that um, they want to use the uh, Council of Europe where they cannot uh, act on behalf of the, of the Union. I would like you to ask you now about another mechanism that uh, the the European Commission is making the, the first steps in uh, introducing, I mean, the, the rule of law mechanism that the European Commission proposed uh, this year, uh, which is setting a, a, a three steps approach in cases where uh, the, the state, uh, rule of law has been infringed. I think the, the cases of Hungary or Romania were mentioned, cases you know of, uh, yeah, you yeah. have been involved in. And I would like to ask you, do you think uh, uh, this mechanism is going in the right direction? And do you think, uh, secondly, do you think this kind of mechanism should lead uh, progressively to eliminating this uh, cooperation and verification mechanism for Romania and Bulgaria, which are the only two states in the European Union monitored in this way? Uh, yes, I think it's going in the right direction. It's uh, appropriate that the European Union uh, tries to be a little bit more assertive when it comes to upholding uh, specific obligations with regard to rule of law. And um, it has worked uh, quite well for Romania and Bulgaria and, and uh, I can see a lot of uh, progress and um, I think that uh, very soon uh, Romania and Bulgaria will be on the same line as everybody else. And this is also very much because one has uh, worked actively with, uh, the, with the Council of Europe and that will continue also in the future of course. So, I mean, we are, we are coming closer to a situation where all the European member states are more on an equal footing, I would say. And that is very good. So I, I would like to take you now to the Roma inclusion uh, issue, which I know you are very involved uh, in. And um, there have been some initiatives in the last years. You have been involved together with uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Ander in the Roma Act uh, project, which Romania was a part of. And, uh, what do you think about uh, the way that uh, the Roma inclusion could be taken forward? I mean, do you think we have all the tools we need to increase Roma inclusion? You know, some people said that we need a commissioner for Roma or uh, uh, an agency for Roma inclusion. Do you think that the tools are there uh, to, to increase Roma inclusion or do we need other tools at European level? Well, I, I wouldn't say that all the tools are there, but we have very good tools, the European Commission has uh, big funds which uh, member states can uh, use for um, improving healthcare, uh, housing and that kind of things. Whereas we in the Council of Europe uh, also um, are doing important things, in, uh, I mean to, um, uh, to educate so-called mediators that can work on the ground so that Roma people can get access to social services and so on. Um, there is one uh, missing link which we are now trying to um, uh, do something with and that is, I think there is, an, there is an, uh, a need for enhancing um, self-confidence among Roma people to um, build up uh, a stronger um, Roma identification and trust in their own culture, their own history, and also to spread the understanding of the Roma history and the Roma culture uh, outside the Roma communities. And that's why we are now trying to set up um, uh, what we call a Roma Institute at the European level that can do exactly this. Um, so. 
I think we, we, we have most of the tools. Now we have to use the tools in a better way and to coordinate them and get them to work together. Regarding the crisis in Ukraine and Russia's military intervention in Crimea, do you think there is a risk of similar conflicts erupting in Europe? It is because uh, what uh, actually started the whole crisis was the fact that people went to the streets because they could not any longer tolerate the corruption, the misuse of power, mismanagement of power. So we got a revolution which of course set other things in motion which we have seen uh, in Ukraine. And I mean, we have the same potential many other places in Europe. Uh, if we are not able to combat corruption, if we are not able to set up independent and efficient judiciaries, having um, independent institutions, checks and balances, separation of power. So, uh, I mean, this is the old lesson, not only in Europe, but we saw it in the South Mediterranean also. Mm, when you get uh, widespread corruption, misuse of power, uh, people uh, make revolutions and that's, uh, well, it can happen in many places in Europe. We have had presidential elections in Ukraine on Sunday in which Petro Poroshenko has won a landmark victory. Do you think that Mr. Poroshenko has now the kind of legitimacy he needs in order to work both with Western partners and European institutions and with Russia, which is essential for the escalation in the Eastern Ukraine? Yeah, I spoke with uh, uh, Mr. Poroshenko only an hour ago. And I said to him that I was very glad that he was elected and elected in the first round. This is a clear message to, of course, Ukraine, but to the whole outside world, what the Ukrainian people wants. And uh, if they take it from there and uh, now start a real constitutional process, which can be inclusive uh, and also get uh, elections for um, a new parliament because they also need a parliament that is legitimate. Uh, then I think Ukraine is on the right path and that it is indeed possible to keep the unity of, and territorial integrity of, um, of Ukraine. But they have a very, very difficult situation. That's obvious with regard to the economy, the situation in eastern Ukraine and uh, I mean but, I mean, they have gone through the first phase and electing their own president, and that's very important. How do you think uh, Russia will act in the next few years? That's difficult to say, but uh, it is a clear message to Russia that uh, Ukraine has elected its own president. He, well, not all the people in eastern Ukraine were able to vote, but many of them and Poroshenko also got, got a lot of support there. So, I mean, the message is very clear. And I hope that the uh, Russian Federation will adapt to that. Um, and uh, I was glad to, s to see that uh, President Putin said that they will respect uh, the, the outcome of the elections. So that is the first good sign, also from, from their side. Uh, I would like to ask you now about the frozen, uh, frozen uh, conflicts in the region. What is the lesson to be learned from the crisis in Ukraine uh, about the frozen conflicts? I mean, is it important to do more to solve them now until they get, uh, you know, really hot? Yes, I think so. Um, and uh, what is important also is to... There, there are efforts to find political solutions um, for in many of these conflicts, in Transiester, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, but what is lacking is also to take on board uh, how important um, uh, rule of law and human rights is in this uh, context. So that's why I think one needs now, we need to find a way or working in these areas uh, because it, I think it can help build up a lot of trust if people have access 
to the human rights protection system that we have set up in, in Europe. Um, so uh, let's hope that uh, the crisis in Ukraine can now mm, teach us a lesson, namely that it's better to have, take some preventive measures rather than to let things develop into a major crisis. Yeah, taking you a bit further, I think you discussed with our uh, foreign ministry, uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, uh, the issue of uh, Transnistria. You know that the European Parliament adopted a resolution in which uh, they were calling in res uh, the respect of the the rights of the uh, Romanian uh, speaking uh, minority there, and uh, there have been some steps undertaken. Do you think the situation has improved? There were some uh, signs of improvement after the elections in uh, Transnistria. I would say a little bit more of a, uh, attitude of cooperation. Um, but I, I don't think that the crisis we have seen now in Ukraine has helped <laughs> uh, in that direction. But maybe we will come back to that. And what I think what is in, uh, important is what you said, namely to safeguard the rights of the, all the minor minorities, not only there, but I would say in particularly in this region. Uh, so uh, by doing that, uh, it can, we can create uh, more confidence, uh, which is of uh, imp great importance for solving this conflict. So we are working with uh, so-called confidence-building measures on both sides of the, of the river. Um, and we are trying also to use our instruments in these areas, which can help um, uh, uh, upholding basic rights for the people living there. Uh, speaking of uh, minorities, you know that Romania was one of the countries with a substantive min minority uh, in Ukraine. The Romanian minor minority had the right to use uh, uh, its own language. And at some point, the new authorities in Kiev have uh, adopted a law which, is, uh, which was amending uh, an old law which was allowing to, for this to happen now. The Romania is asking and other countries which have minorities in Ukraine are asking for the same thing. Do you think the, the new authorities in Ukraine should allow them to use their own language in Ukraine? Well, there is an obligation uh, that Ukraine has under the so-called Charter for Regional and Local uh, Languages, um, which one should uh, look into. And I'm sure that the new authorities in Kiev now will take very seriously the rights of the minorities in general, and in particular the rights uh, to, to, to use their own language, because this is uh, one of the core issues in, this, in the conflict that we have seen in, um, in Ukraine. So I'm convinced, and, and uh, uh, I myself have um, a um, special representative working in the Ukrainian parliament in order to give them advice and assistance with regard to new legislation. And I'm, I know that uh, this issue is uh, quite high on the agenda, but of course they have had many other things on their plate. But when things are coming down, they will come back to these uh, very important uh, questions related to rights of the minorities and right uh, to, sp to use their own uh, language. Now let me take you in the end to a more philosophical question. What do you think will be the biggest challenge for your organization uh, in the years to come? I think it is really related to the fact that uh, Europe becomes more and more diverse with regard to culture, religion, uh, uh, minorities have always been a difficulty for Europe and we have seen it again. So. Coping with this um, di uh, diversity will be the number one issue for Europe. We have to get the European peoples to not only accept this situation, 
that we have become a much more diverse continent, but also to get uh, use of it. It is actually a good thing for Europe that we have got more people from the outside, otherwise we couldn't uphold uh, the level of welfare we have. We are totally dependent on them and of course they are contributing also to uh, diversify our own culture, which is a good thing uh, for us. But to get the European people to accept this, uh, it is a difficult um, task. And uh, I think that this is uh, much more of a challenge that the economic crisis has been. It can be overcome, um, but to, um, to deal with uh, a society that becomes more and more pluralistic is... Uh, is it, I, I used to call it a good challenge but it is a dif very difficult one and not accepted by many and that's, that's what we are see seeing, I think, in the European elections, that these extreme parties are playing on this uh, situation and creating a lot of fear uh, in the population.